MEP, thank you very much. Dear friends, shout out Dr. Jain. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, friends, first let me say something to uh, Mr. Sunil Prasad. Sunil, thank you very much for bringing tips back to where it belongs, the European Parliament. <laughs> After last year in the hotel, I am delighted that we are here. Look at the audience, look at the vibrancy, look at the connection. Thank you very much, Sunil. And thank you very much to all those in the European setup, the EU setup, the Parliament, who have assisted EICC and made all this possible. Very happy to see so many of you from India and from so many other parts of Europe who are here to embellish this conference and for us to you know, debate meaningfully on how to take India-EU uh, relations forward, or india europe <coughs> Mr. M Member of Parliament, I want to uh, start by saying that I very much like this business of 150% duty on fine whiskey to be removed. <laughs> it seems to be a very neat conspiracy among several of us. As you know, India, they say, consumes more Scotch whiskey than is produced in Scotland. <laughs> the CEO of Diageo is Indian. David was born in India. And there are a whole lot of us here. This is very particular. <laughs> On the second matter of this response business, I think I should clarify to you, there have been so many contacts between us and the relevant authorities of the European Union structure on, on, on fixing a date for the summit, all after that particular letter of invitation for meeting around G20. Uh, it's been a little difficult to get around dates. Lots of people are traveling, including EU leaders and our leader too. Uh, but we hope that there shall be uh, a get together, of course, uh, possibly, hopefully on the sidelines of the G20 itself, and we take this forward. So I remain extremely optimistic that we are going to take this thing forward. I should also just let you know that uh, Prime Minister Modi met uh, President Hollande and Prime Minister David Cameron on the sidelines of the United Nations General Assembly recently, in fact, for yesterday in New York. Uh, Chancellor Merkel is going to be in India with the week's time. Prime Minister Modi has stressed to all these leaders his interest in the VDI forum. So I think we have that kind of interest at the highest level. Naturally, we need to make uh, various things come through. And you have uh, very rightly, David, uh, outlined the fact that uh, these negotiations do have an element of both perception, politics, they also have a need for being win-win on both sides, uh, just as Europe always makes the analysis and picks things on that, that the study must show that we have benefits to our economy. You know, as we have become of age and things have moved on, stakeholders in India have also become extremely uh, uh, knowledgeable about it and they know exactly what they want. So it needs, becomes important that whatever agreement is reached, when it's reached, is one which has a win-win, i.e. it's also celebrated to us and our people and stakeholders feel that they have uh, a gain. I have no doubt that there would be gains in it, but I think that's particularly important. Uh, friends, please allow me to say that today you've heard the Honorable Member of the European Parliament speak about one specific aspect, a very important and big aspect of India-EU relations. We have Dr. R.K. Jain here who's a specialist has written tomes about it, is currently lecturing at the Louvain University, who will also speak on this. We have Shada here, who is our resident expert on the subject here in Brussels. So let me leave it to them, and let me allow myself also to be a little educated about it. But I want to make two separate sets of points. One, India and Europe, they are moving ahead. All of you are well aware and our Prime Minister made signature visits to France. He was in uh, Germany for the Hanover Trade Fair, where India was a partner country after some 30 years. The world's largest technology fair, and India was a partner country, and we had obviously a massive set of interactions. Chancellor Merkel is going to India in the first week of October. Newspapers are reporting, so it's Nothing secret, Prime Minister is going to be in the UK in the early parts of, uh, in the middle of November. And again, I have no doubt that it will result in a tremendous amount of resonance in terms of businesses in Europe, in the UK naturally, among the Indian communities, among the business community that friends of India. And 
this brings me to what all of you would have seen, front page news in several newspapers worldwide, the Prime Minister's signature visit to the United States, this time with a fair amount of time being spent in the West Coast, which was the first time that any Indian Prime Minister did in something like 40 or 50 years. Massive interactions with Facebook, with Google, with Twitter, with Tesla, and across the board. What is the one clear message? The clear message is that A, India is open for business. The digital area is, of course, extremely important for us. Important for us. Why? Because we need to leapfrog. We need to leapfrog from not even having the proper connectivity to going well beyond that. And it is important that this is done in a short span of time because globalization has meant that even in the remote villages in India, people have aspirations. And it's absolutely important that their aspirations are met and they are allowed to feel part of the empowerment process which is being unleashed. Of course, I'm very happy that the Indian economy is the largest uh, or the fastest growing economy among large economies in the world. Our uh, various factors, the inflation rates have been down, our foreign exchange is relatively healthy. All of these are certainly plus points. Yesterday, the governor of the Reserve Bank of India, who we uh, asked by many people that you should do a little bit more to push for growth, uh, announced a 50 basis points reduction in interest rates. This should result in a huge amount of energy and give a significant boost to it. Today morning's newspapers in India have this particular as its headline. This is an FT report and this is a report which appeared yesterday in the Financial Times which quotes the uh, Foreign Direct Investment Market Survey which is an FD, FD company, which says that India pitched the United States and China as the number one FDI destination for the first half of 2015. The uh, CapEx estimations of what went into India during the on, on Greenfield project at $31 billion is uh, $3 billion even ahead of what is estimated to have gone into the United States. <coughs> Why am I saying all this? I'm saying all this because Europe and I have maintained this all throughout, has a tremendous advantage with the India. You are and have been for a long time the largest source of foreign direct investment. European companies know India exceedingly well. In fact, I was delighted to uh, see our colleague here, who is here on the dais with us, and who mentioned that they have as many as 1,500 people in India working on different aspects of India, including those which I consider as sunrise areas for cooperation, the defense, energy sector, and of course, steel, where perhaps India is the only place where things are going forward. I say this because I believe that for European corporates, it is an opportunity where they can leverage their mm -hmm. old connections. They can leverage the fact that they have knowledge about India, about the Indian market, about the Indian people who they have to deal with. They have a certain amount of familiarity with the rules and regulations and the laws. And above all, they also possibly have Indians working in their setup. All of this helps. Please take advantage of it. And this is my call to India, to the European corporate. I'm very happy that uh, Count de Preza and uh, Ravi, you, you know, you all have set up this skill development initiative. I think this is a particularly important one for India, certainly, because we must do something about the large number of youths that are going to be coming to the fore in India. They need to be self-employed, they need to have talent utilization, SETU, in fact, is one of these big government programs. So kudos to you and wish you all the very best here. In some other areas, let me draw your attention to this. Areas in which the European Union, I believe, has very special significance and great ability. <coughs> the first is that you have, and now I'm talking about the European Union and not about Europe. The European Union has some of the world's best abilities in terms of being able to create templates for development, especially smart and such developments which are inclusive and sustainable. Let me look at smart cities. This is one of the signature programs of the government. India, which used to always consider itself basically to be a rural country, is slowly but surely waking up to the fact 
that in the next 20 odd years, possibly half of our population will live in urban agglomeration. We have no choice but to ensure that these are engines of growth, they provide employment, they are sustainable, and perhaps the most important need is they are geared up for the time to come, which means they need to be smart. The European Union has done excellent work on it. We are very happy to talk to several of those people. Even in the area of the utilization of ICT for smartness in cities and urban areas, some of the best work has been done. 